Welcome to the feature series, How Roger Penske Changed the Indy 500 on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, which celebrates the most successful entrant at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the 50th anniversary of his first event in 1969. Presented by Cooper Tires, the Justice Brothers, and Bell Racing Helmets, a longstanding partner of Team Penske, this 15-part series spans some of the greatest drivers, managers, mechanics, engineers, and the man himself, Roger Penske, to document the captain's vast influence on America's defining motor race, the Indy 500, and in many instances, the sport as a whole. We'll also be joined by a reporter who covered Penske's Indy debut a half century ago and some of his fiercest rivals, many of whom admit to being fans of the 82-year-old icon. Our guest on this episode of How Roger Penske Changed the Indy 500 is former chief mechanic and general manager Derek Walker, whose efforts at Team Penske from the late 1970s through the late 1980s helped the program to become the most dominant force in IndyCar competition. Derek Walker, your name is so heavily associated with Team Penske, I think for many, especially in the 1980s, with so much of the success that you had as we're celebrating, Roger, on this 50th anniversary at the 500, mm. I thought it might actually be fun not to start with your time with RP here, but actually how you came into the frame because you came in through a different Penske mm. program that eventually led to IndyCar. How did you guys come together? Where did you meet? Well, um, I was at Brabham Formula One team, and um, our Quasar third driver was John Watson. And um, in, uh, in Austria, when Mark Donahue was killed, um, they eventually sought out um, uh, John Watson, and he became their driver. And then he mentioned my name because they were looking to strengthen the team and bring in more people, more Formula One people. We had good people, but they with Formula One experience. Mm. And I was one of a few that was uh, recruited. So I went to, to work for Roger in uh, 75, at the end of 75, and um, was chief mechanic. And we were operating out of Poole, Dorset, uh, probably about 2,000 square foot uh, workshop, rented workshop. Tiny. Which used to be Graham McRae. Wow. His shop where he worked out of. And uh, so our team was probably a dozen people if it was no more. So I was there for uh, the two years, uh, nearly two years that lasted. And um, we had moved to a different facility and were, in those days, making our own cars, Formula One cars. And I think uh, Roger saw the potential to build his own IndyCar. And when he decided to stop Formula One, do IndyCar, we, from... One day to the next, we stopped Formula One and uh, started looking at um, IndyCar or NASCAR or USAC or whatever they were called back then, yeah. USAC cars. What did you see in Roger having come from a Brabham team, which I believe would have had Bernie Ecclestone mm -hmm. in, oh, involved yeah. in that time? So if we're talking about titans of the sport, mm. what did you see in Roger Penske in your early days, months, years, working as a part of that operation before you got to, obviously, senior management position and whatnot. But mm. what did you see in those early days that either intrigued you or, or made you feel that there was something proper here? Well, obviously, uh, I'd heard the name and uh, his uh, IndyCar, um, you know, his Indy 500, Donahue uh, years. I'd heard about it, and I um, knew a little bit about the story of him but i didn't never knew what he was like and when i was interviewed by him um i could see he he was very uh, focused on a lot of the the details and he knew what he was looking at you know and he he pushed he wanted performance you know he didn't uh, he didn't expect anybody to do anything more than they could do but he wanted to get the right people there and his intensity level and his attention to that team um, building that he had and um, the focus on the competition. That was, uh, that was very uh, different than most of the sort of owners you would see around at that time. For me, it was anyway. Bernie was more focused on the business. 
as you could imagine. And uh, Gordon Murray outrun the team with Herbie. Um, but um, Bernie was more business focused. And, uh, you know, Bernie, that's, they're different, but they were very both successful in their own way. So looking at this transition from your introduction through Formula One with Roger to IndyCar, and specifically the Indy 500, tell us about the transition here, coming here, mm. this institution that maybe you had mm. not grown up with as, as we had, but getting a feel for this event and also this series that clearly was the, the center of Roger's universe. How did that shape doing what you do? Nuts and bolts are the same from car to car, mm. but the culture within a team can certainly be shifted towards its greatest priority. Yeah, well, uh, f for a Formula One guy to come over here in 77, it was, it was the first one I think I saw, and I worked during the Sneva on the Sneva car as one of just to get experience of knowing what I was looking at, because by then I was running the build shop in England. I wasn't over here full time. And so I'd fly over and attend the races and be part of the team just so I'd go back with a you know, notepad full of all the things that we need to change or do or they need to make. And so uh, when I came to the first race, um, the place uh, was impressive for sure. It was... Um, kind of a little dated when you look at the procedures and the regulations and the sure. you know the, the garages were in you know it was it, it was all awaiting big. renovation well it was big but it was kind of a little bit behind the times in many respects and the, and the cars were too um i mean we were used to in formula one doing things a little differently and and i thought at the time still do that um, the ingredients uh, that Formula One gave Roger really benefited his uh, IndyCar success in the future. If he had never been involved and recruited a lot of F1 people as we were mm. then, I think that um, that development uh, to be in us as uh, as he is today would have probably taken him longer. But you know when. When the race starts, it's a race, and there are things you've got to do right, and the things. And so, whether it was a little different than Formula One, it was still impressive, and it's still you still needed to know your stuff. So it was, it was an interesting time to uh, transition into USAC at that time. Looking at that era, we starting to we are starting to get into a very rich vein of success for Team Penske at the 500. Mm. Obviously, with Rick Mears, Bobby Unser, Rick Mears again, Danny Sullivan, Al Unser Senior, Rick Mears again, and yeah. Let's talk about your role in that as well, because you were definitely one of the first people folks thought of in terms of the crew and team helping mm. to facilitate. Were there any instructions given to you when you were placed in that senior management role? Uh, did that evolve naturally? Curious how Roger steered you towards what he was hoping for. Well, you know, Roger, as I said, was a very hands-on uh, owner uh, and boss. Um, so you listened very carefully what he wanted and you, you, you went about delivering it the best way you knew how. Um, he was... Um, you know, he's just focused about the results, um, but smart enough, I think, to be able to know people and pick people. And if something wasn't right, it needed to be changed. And so uh, it was a, a learning experience for me. I think it sharpened my whole senses being in that environment where expectations were there that delivery had to happen and people had to deliver, but it was still a good atmosphere to work in but the pressure was on and we had good stuff you know we had good cars good drivers and if we didn't have good cars we still had good drivers and good teams and so you know success you almost figured was um uh, was going to come if you just keep doing what you're doing and and follow the mission statement given by roger you know that's roger's i think 
big success. He has a vision of what he wants, and uh, and uh, he'll change quickly uh, directions if he senses it's not not working you know he's not going to just sit back and rest on his laurels every race is like his first race you mm. know he's that competitive and that rubs off through the whole team uh, nobody waltzes around without knowing when you join that team you better hit the ground running because everybody else is running and you, you got to stay with the pack stay with the program which is good it's a great atmosphere there are a lot of names associated with Team Penske, especially during the 1980s, late 70s, 1980s, crew chiefs, mechanics, you name it. Share some thoughts about those that you worked with, those that you managed, just this collegial environment where, at least as I look back now, and I think many people look back now, there's just all-star after all-star mm. after all-star. It's often we look back at a team from an era and single out one or two people mm-hmm. seems like we'd fill both hands trying to count all those who really distinguish themselves who were some that you just recall not at the exclusion of any others but oh. you had a lot of folks really helping to make this team great well when i got involved in the program jim mcgee was there already and uh, he took him to a certain you know point in racing and then he left to go with uh, pat patrick um the crew chiefs, they changed over the years, and you can look at a lot of changes in personnel over those years and, and see success in different periods. And uh, uh, the one constant is Roger Penske. And so picking those the right people and giving them clear direction of what you expect um, in every respect, not just by winning, every respect the way you look the way you keep time the way you you know do the job the attention to detail everything is is an expected thing and it the one constant's been roger and uh, but all the crew chiefs you know pete parrot daryl soppy you know bob Sprow, i mean we can chuck sprague i mean we could clive Howe. you know we could look at them all over the years and there's many more after i left um, they were picked, handpicked, and they performed. But the guy who overall masterminded it was Roger. He picked the people, he approved, it, and he had a mission. And and that, to me, is uh, what really is the uh, the fifty years of racing and the success is an incredible you know, level of focus that he has on racing. And a sense, he has got a, an acute sense of timing mm. of what to do, what not to do, when to do it. And, you know, we all get it wrong sometime, but his average is pretty damned high, as we can see. Since 1954, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has served as the proving grounds for the world's most legendary helmet brand. From Jimmy Bryan to Mario Andretti and Elio Castro Neves, Bell Helmets has and continues to protect some of the all-time greats. Follow the journey on social media at Bell Racing HQ or by visiting bellracing.com. Spoken about this next topic with a few different people that have been with or were with Roger for many years, I'd love to get your take on this because it was especially during this really codifying mm. era. What's an average meeting like with Roger about either expectations for the year, a particular race, could be the 500? Mm-hmm. I think some might have the impression that he is the conductor telling everyone how to play mm-hmm. their instruments to his expectation. There's also maybe the less spoken aspect of he certainly sets standards and expectations, mm. but he is not necessarily operating his folks like you uh, as marionettes. Oh, absolutely. No, he, he delegates. Um, that's the one thing. If he picks you for whatever job you're doing, he lets you get on with it. And, uh, yeah, if he chimes in, it's probably because he thinks, hey, you could benefit from knowing we ought to think about that or about that. But in those meetings, uh, it, it, it was less about Roger 
conducting everybody. Um, that's not his style. But there is that voice of experience or the, you know, he'll call it if it needs to be called. But he's, um, he's a, a good delegator, I found. Uh, I certainly, in my years, um, felt that he, he gave us a lot of, uh, a lot of free reign. But, he, you know, if you wanted, hey, do you think we ought to do that? He, you got that answer. It's not like he didn't. He wasn't in touch with it. But you know, he's realistic enough to know that he can't be everywhere, and know every detail, and he doesn't expect to be. He hires good people, and he expects them to do the job, and and that's that's what he should. That's the commander, right? That's what he should do. If he's got to go out and jump in the trenches and start shooting as well, and how how good is that going to be? Who's going to be running the show? You know, you've got to have. Somebody the visionary and the the momentum of the team was part of him was generated by him and everybody uh, thrived on that. I mean, you feed off that. You want to do better. You want to make him feel he's got the best guy and he picked the best guy and you are doing the job that you want to do. But you know, at the end of the day, um, he's going to look at the results. He might like you, but at the end of the day, he still wants to win races. And if you're not quite all there, then you can't expect him to say, well, this guy's good. I like him. I'm going to keep him. It's the bottom line is the team's got to win. And uh, we all know that. There's no nobody under any illusion of that isn't the case. It is. Always. Which, when you think about it, a race team should be, right? It should be all about that. But some people take longer to get there. And Roger's a lot sharper on that side, knowing, senses whether he's got a good thing. And he's also in the in, at the time of defeat, when it really goes wrong, um, he's also the guy that will, you know, hey, let's focus on the next race, let's get this. And he's going, he, you know, he'll, he's not going to sit there and cry and cry or beat up everybody or whatever. He... He picks it up and move on. You know, he's a racer. If the race is in, ends and you didn't win, then on the next one. Let's, how can we win the next one? And that that also helps the team a lot. You hold a fairly unique place among those who spent many years working for Roger in that you, Gilles de Ferrin comes to mind. There's a small handful of folks who were a part of Team Penske who then went on to start their own teams. <clears throat> yeah. Interesting, uh, I think, a beautiful piece of lineage as well, knowing that Al Holbert worked for Roger as a young kid yeah. and was just beloved by Roger. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Al at the Columbus uh, IMSA race in 1988, but that also meant that there was a Porsche IndyCar team mm. in need of someone to manage and run it, which uh, you would assume and take on there. But you also then just ran strictly your own team, sometimes small, not a threat to Roger, <laughs> at times still mm. maybe not big, definitely a threat to Roger. What can you share with us in terms of things that you might have learned while with Roger that were applied to your team and teams and what was it like competing against the person that you certainly helped earn many mm. 8500 victories well you know i i owe a lot to roger i learned a lot and owe him a lot um i always think that the the best compliment i could ever pay him would be to beat him you know to take whatever i have and race against his team and win i would uh, I would think that's the best compliment I can give him. On the um, Al Holbert uh, re came after me and asked me, was I interested? And my interest with Al was mainly um, I wanted to have a part of a race team. I didn't want it all. I, I'd like it all, but I'm realistic enough if I could get a piece of a race team. And and it, uh, uh, Roger's team, there wasn't that wasn't the option in those days. And so Al just coincidentally came along at the time when I was starting to think about how where could I go. Not that I was, you know, unhappy at Roger's, I just wanted my career to go the next step and I couldn't see me going any further. Um, maybe it's short sighted, I don't know. But I would have stayed and, and been happy to stay if I wasn't that something inside. So anyway, Al 
offered me, I think it was like 10% of his race team, which wasn't Porsche. It was little Albert's, uh, um, Al Albert's team. Um, and I thought, that's my chance. And then, of course, he was killed. And, um, you know, I, uh, I thought, well, I'm out now. I'll just have to make the best of it. And Porsche still needed to continue. So they said, please run the team. So two years, I ran the team, two and a half, whatever it was. But uh, when I started my own team, the biggest um, thing I really wanted to do was to beat Roger. And not for a personal reason. It was he set the standard. And if I could beat him, our team was, our team was going somewhere. So in that respect, um, but I learned, I wouldn't say everything because I was a mechanic before I was Roger's chief mechanic and then general manager or whatever I was. Um, but I learned uh, you know, a professional side of racing, the, exp the exposure I got through dealing with him as he grew his empire was uh, invaluable. I learned to, and when in fact anybody sees my race shop, or I have a man cave down in Florida. If you see it, it's mm. like a Penske racing shop. There's a red floor and gray, because you know imitation to that detail is the greatest form of flattery. Neat, tidy, in order, everything. You know that part. I got all got it from Penske. There was no doubt. Perfection. That was the what it was really. Try to be as good as you can possibly be. Penske perfect. And he is, as we can see. And, uh, you know, he's smart enough to raise the money to be able to do that. You've got to have money. But it isn't just money. You, you know, there's a lot of teams probably spending just, you know, close to what he's spending or maybe the same. I don't know anymore. But um, they, when you look at it, what keeps his teams successful, it it can't no longer be all the money he has. He, got to know what you got to do with it and you got to have the right people to make it happen and um, that's where he's smart enough to pick the right people and you know he's got Tim Sindrick there and you know he's he's doing what I did and um, Roger's getting older sorry to say but he is and I'm sure he's leaving more responsibility for Tim and that that's um, you know that that kind of training he got working for him is going to keep that Penske sort of uh, team heading in the same direction, whether Roger's there or not, I would think. Let's close, Derek, with the central theme, this being 50 years of Roger at the Speedway. What are the things that come to mind in terms of influence, change? How has this building, this facility I'd all extend it out to this sport as well. What are the things that this man has shaped and changed as a result of him showing up here for the first time in 1969 as an entrant? Mm. Well, it, it, it's a damn good question because um, I've often said over the years that um, if Roger Penske had been the Bernie Eccleston of American racing, American racing would look quite a bit different than it does now. He's influenced American racing on occasions, but to my, uh, from my observation, not continuously and not being the top guy. He, he operates from the shadow, from the side. Um, if he goes and, you know, tries to change the sport, he gets criticized that... You know, he's big Penske doing this and doing that. And so, in my opinion, he, he stays back of the, off the spotlight and tries to influence. But if people want to hear him, he's not going to lose any sleep. If they say this cars are going to have free wheels, he'll disagree with it. And you say, are you sure you're right about this free wheel? I don't think that's the way to do it. It's not going to work. Okay, three wheels. I'll go build the best three wheeler are you could ever get and beat the shit out of you. And and you know he he gets on with his racing. He doesn't focus on saying, well, I've got a great race team here. Why don't I go and you know take over IndyCar or something like that? I mean, he, not at this stage in his life, he doesn't need it or want it. But I think if he'd be more upfront involved but you know he was running his race team and he's 
more importantly, he's running his big business that he was building. And, you know, he can't be in both places. But if he was free enough to do the, the Bernie thing and take over and really mold and work and build a strong franchise, build money up that comes in so people can earn a living and something to have value when you have a race team, um, I think that American racing would look much different than it is. Because he'd surround himself with a few, it wouldn't be many, but a few of the right people. I think so. I don't think, I don't see anybody else over that period that uh, could have done it as, as well as he could. My opinion. And that was how Roger Penske changed the Indy 500. You can catch this series in more than 500 episodes at the brand new Marshall Pruitt Podcast com site all brought to you by cooper tires the justice brothers and bell racing helmets <laughs>